This episode of Chop and Brew is brought to you with support from Imperial Yeast. More information on Imperial Yeast strains for home brewers and professional brewers at imperialyeast.com. And our amazing Patreon supporters. Keep the show going strong and get fun rewards, bonus content, early access to videos, a private Facebook group, by going to patreon.com slash chop and brew. Let's do this! Chop and brew, chop, chop. Twinsies, <laughs> the Hopsy Twins. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Chop and Brew. Once again, we are in the house of Fowler, aka Fowler House, aka Casa de Snackstick, with our good buddy Paul Fowler. We are brewing off camera the Weedy Brown from Michael Dawson's Mash Maker book. But what I really want to talk to Paul about, and what some of you have asked about, is his water chemistry regimen uh and why it's important and what you do you know we did this episode for the courage russian imperial stout and we kind of blew past a lot of the technical we really just Mm -hmm. stuck to what the beer was and some people emailed and commented and were just like what's he doing with the ph what's he doing with all this stuff we showed the stuff and didn't explain it so we want to kind of do a crash course of entry level would you call it that sure water chemistry and then Paul lined up a little, uh, what do we call this, a sensory panel, taste panel for water chemistry in one of his beers. So first and foremost, man, uh, you were telling me you started doing water chemistry not because your local water is necessarily bad, but it was inconsistent. Right, where I live, there's, uh, there's three wells that feed this city, and I figured, well, I could have some inconsistency in the brews with that being the case. So I decided early on within like the second batch to, to brew with RO water and have a clean slate that I could build off of and it'd be the same every single time. So I don't have to worry about that variable changing. Hops, yeast, malt, we're used to experimenting with, but this very vital ingredient that a lot of people ignore and just do tap or do whatever. Yeah. You are building it from the ground up. Yeah. I'm okay. using RO. Was using, there's a couple of spreadsheets out there. Um, Martin Mugard is the one I use, the, the brew and water. Um, if you Google, Google brew and water, it'll take you to a spreadsheet and there's a lot of good information on there. Uh, definitely recommend reading all that first before you start playing around with the tool. You can get a water report from the city, but the city is usually pretty limited in what they'll give you. Uh, Ward Labs is a better route, route to go. You can get a brewer's test from them. Um, they'll send you a little vial, you fill up your water, send it back, and they'll send you a water report for brewing. Yeah. So everything we want to look at uh, for your sample. And you said not only did you send them Becker, Minnesota water, you sent them some of your RO water just yep. to totally get like, yep. and we saw it's not completely zero milligrams no. of everything, parts per million. It's, there's a little something, but for the most part, you're starting with a blank slate. Pretty much, yeah. So what are the things, um, we've got video in this brew specifically that you use today, you put at least five things into it, kind of walk us through the basics of what each of those are for. Today I put in calcium chloride, uh, is usually in every beer I make uh, or water profile I have. We put in gypsum today. Gypsum goes with calcium chloride and the sulfate to chloride ratio and how the beer is going to come out, like malty or balanced or bitter. We saw that gypsum um, specifically enhances bitterness. Yeah, it kind of dries out the beer. Uh, makes the hops come out a little more, dries it out, kind of makes the hops pop, or chloride makes it rounder, softer, more malty. Um, and that ratio, you can play with that ratio to make the beer present a different way. We put in pickling lime today <laughs> because we have a dark grain bill, and that being a, a more acidic grain bill than, say, all Pilsner malt, um, it's going to need more alkalinity in it. We're, our water doesn't have any alkalinity, it's pretty much a blank slate. I didn't need to add any acid to this, but I needed some alkalinity. So the pickling lime was there to add 
bicarbonate, alkalinity, and it also gave me more calcium, yeah. which isn't a bad thing. We also put in a little, just like a pinch of salt, just for some sodium. I think that the was magnesium. A oh yeah, the Epsom salt. Epsom salt, that's little, right. A little Epsom salt too. And the difference between the salt salt and the Epsom salt is Epsom what? salt uh, adds hardness, gives you like some hardness. I think it adds magnesium and chloride, if I'm right. And sodium is uh, salt, you know, it's uh, sodium chloride, I think it is. So this sounds like super nerdy yeah. and super complex, but what are you, what is really happening here? What is the balance we're trying to strive for. It's about pH. Right, the whole point of any futzing with your water is to get that mash pH right. And that's gonna set the stage for everything downstream of that. So if you can get that mash pH right, your sparge pH is gonna be good, your boil pH is gonna be good, your hop utilization is gonna be good, I mean, every, and then your finished beer pH is gonna be driven from your mash pH. If you had a really high mash pH, don't expect your beer pH to be where it should be. Um, so it kinda sets the stage for everything. And like we have here, you can adjust to taste right. your water profile. So if you brew a beer and you're like, hey, this is pretty good, but I wonder, if I should make this a little more bitter or a little more malty, you could adjust it in the glass as we did here yeah. and try it. That's so crazy to think like, whereas your first instinct would be like, I need to adjust my hop quantity, quality, time. Right. There's another thing that you can mess with right. that might actually be the answer. It's kind of the final so like, thing. Yeah. You should really do your recipe first. Yeah. I mean, this does have an impact, um, pretty significant, but your bit, your malt bill and your hops are gonna have a bigger impact. But this is like fine tuning it. Real quick before we taste these, talk about why you um, you do some adjustments to the mash and the sparge, and they're not identical. Why do both of those sets of water need some uh, attention? Um, well, the way brewing water is set up, your overall profile is, it, it'll give you the amounts for the overall profile. So if you were doing- Meaning brewing, the end result. The end result. Right. So if you were doing brewing a bag, which all the water is there in the beginning, in the mash, you don't have any sparge water. It's all right there. You would add all the mm. salts right there. But since we have sparge water, yep. you're going to have so much in the mash to get your mash pH rate, right, and the rest goes in the sparge. Because if you're- doing due diligence to get your mash pH to a certain level, but then you're just sparging with tap water, you're missing half the point. Right. Because you're just going to suddenly wash this thing into you're gonna, it. You're going to throw your, uh, the thing you try to create it out of balance, your, your okay. water profile. So let's taste these. So we got our control, yeah. which is a beautiful hoppy Hellas. Jink. Paul Fowler. Thank you. And it is light to begin with. Yep. So this would definitely have a different salt um, yes. combination than a Russian Imperial Stout. So this this <laughs> obviously would not need any um, pickling lime, but it would need a bunch of acid to drop that pH. Okay. Because your malt bill is not going to be acidic enough to drop the pH. And it's very balanced. It's very grainy. Mm -hmm. Pills malt in the forefront, but it's. It's got some bitterness, but not like a German pills, right. which you also have on tap. So right. I would say this is extremely balanced and totally crushable. Mm -hmm. If we move to the G. Yeah, gypsum. The gypsum. Yeah. The end result should theoretically be more bitter or, or drier. 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 And having tasted this, we know that that's true. Yeah. And you'll see from the video, he literally stuck the head of a screwdriver into the gypsum, put it in, stirred it up. We're talking a that, very small amount That here. was enough. <laughs> I mean, you didn't have a big sample size here, so it doesn't take much to adjust it in the glass. But this can give you an idea of where to take your beer in a future brews. It's left it more astringent. It's, it's made dry. it almost feel more carbonated, even though I know that's not the case. Right. It just really subdued the malt and the sweet. Yeah. And let the I hop... Get, I get a lot of drying on the tongue. It's yeah. just, just really dry. It's almost, it's not chalky, but astringent, I would say. Yeah, so this is not not my, not the way I would want to take it. Uh, and then this one you added what to? 
uh, calcium chloride. So this would make it more malty, softer, sweeter. And almost tastes less fermented than that one. Yeah, this one's by like a point or two. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 definitely not as dry as that gypsum one. That's crazy. Yeah, that's crazy how good your beer is, Paul. That this tastes <laughs> so balanced. So you mentioned brewing water, B R U apostrophe N water. We'll link it below. Mm -hmm. um, check the video description. It's an information site, but it's also a, a spreadsheet. Brown balanced. Your sulfide to chloride ratio is one. He's got one point three. If you go to multi. Here it's 0.7. You can type in your numbers and it will help you figure out yep. where to take them. Yeah, you don't have to use it with just our roll, but you can put in, get a water report wherever you get it at, and then you put plug that in the brewing water, and then Martin Brewing Yard's got a whole bunch of different profiles in there Yeah. for different styles of beer, different cities, um, what have you. So you can have your city water and you line up that other profile, and then what do you have to do to hit that? But you've noticed that even his guidelines are still just that. He's yeah. got like, oh, this is where I think multi-balanced is, and mm -hmm. your multi-balance is actually yep. a little higher or lower. Mine's I always more. get weird with pH, because it's like, well, is it more acidic or less as a pH goes up or down? Yep. But it's not it's not the end game, but he's definitely pointing you in the right direction Yes. if you're interested in experimenting with water, as is John Palmer's water book yeah. which is where our makeshift sensory panel idea came from any other good resources that you found on the waterfront to waterfront uh aga delang is a really good source for water i think he contributed on the water book with john palmer and he does a lot of works on that stuff i've used that easy water spreadsheet calculator it's similar but i, I like brewing water much better it's much more in depth more detailed. So if someone's just brewing every beer in the catalog in the style guidelines with tap water, what are they most likely missing out on? From the stouts to the pale ale to the pilsner to the sour, what are they not getting by just using this one neutral or one consistent water uh, profile? I don't think any, any one profile is perfect for across the board. Um, like my city water is high in bicarbonate, it's very alkaline, um, it's got more chloride than sulfite, so it would be good for like a dark multi beer. But if you tried to brew a Pilsner with that, it would be horrific. You'd have to look at the style, is it a malt forward style, a hot forward style, um, kind of a balanced style, and you can go from there. Personally I started with some of Brungard's water profiles and his, like you said, his multi profiles in this range. And for me personally, it was too multi. So then I started adjusting by the glass. I'm like, do I want to go this way or that way? Oh, maybe I want to go this way. So next brew, I up that a little bit. Eventually I got the profiles. Tastes good to me. And that's set. I don't have to do that anymore. I don't futz with my water anymore because I have some set profiles. So I have a multi, a bitter, a balanced, done. That's it. So any just thing I do now on a recipe is the recipe is the... If it seems intimidating to somebody, that's an easy way to look at it. Uh -huh. In the end, you really only need kind of three or four. Right. You don't really have to do this every brew. No. And then rebrew it five times to feel like you have it. Right. Okay. Just apply uh, what kind of profile you want on the beer, whether you're malty, hoppy, whatever, and uh, make sure you get your mash pH. So throughout the process to make sure that your brewing salts combination held true, you take the pH a few times. I do. What temp do you go for here? I usually go for about 72-ish, so I'll just wait a little bit. I take it at the, I'll take a 10 minute at the, in the mash. Yep. Um, I'll take one at the end of the mash. I'll take one at sparge, just to see how much it changed. And then I'll take one at boil. Um, and usually your 60 minute drifts down a little bit, your sparge will go up because you're diluting it, and then the boil is the two combined and it's usually pretty close to what you started with. 
So if it was too high in the boil kettle at the end and you wanted to adjust it, you can. You could put some acid in there and drop it down. You can adjust it at any of these points. So being hyper aware of the number allows you those opportunities to adjust it. Right. If you want. But in this case, specifically tonight, we evened back out to about what you wanted. Was mm -hmm. it like 5.49? Yeah, something like that. 5.4, 5.39, so, or whatever it was. But the most important ones are clearly, you want to take it in the mash, and then you want to take it before the boil, because these are the two times you can really, those are your opportunities to make sure it doesn't stray too far away from target. Mm -hmm. Yep. This is way more stuff than I ever do. I thought I pulled a lot of stuff out of the basement to take to the garage. You've got, but your system is so beautiful, man. It stays got, in the garage. <laughs> you, know, you got your towel for the spillovers. You got uh -huh. the pH. Yeah. It's a thing of beauty, man. There's a reason why you got all the metals. Thank you, sir. <laughs> um, so, yeah, check out Brewing Water. Uh, check out Water by John Palmer and yeah. co-host, guest writers. We will post those links underneath here. Check out uh, Paul Fowler's other video on Russian Imperial Stout, Courage Russian Imperial Stout. We don't really talk a lot about it, but you get to see a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. And the beer turned are magnificent, so... Appreciate y'all. Thanks for your support. Chop for chop. Brew for brew. Bam. I'm not. I'm not throwing the gypsum one out of bed. Oh yeah. Shot an episode. That was cool. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Yeah. This episode of Chop and Brew is brought to you with support from Imperial Yeast. More information on Imperial Yeast strains for home brewers and professional brewers at imperialyeast.com. Hey girl, I'm in the closet. I know, I was like, I forgot a recording. Started looking at you with your little microphone in the closet. You're so cute. Oh my God. <laughs>